In the air, Srijan takes it! India win! He'll come back for the second. India have won the test match. India have won the series. They're going to get back for two. India home. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the 81 All Out podcast. This is Siddhartha Vaidyanathan. And I'm joined as ever by my co-host, Mahesh Seturaman. Hi, Mahesh. Hey, Sidhvi. Good to be back. Hey, yeah. And uh, today we are delighted to welcome, um, you know, someone who we have read for a very long time, whose writings we have admired and taken in and uh, sipped and drunk. And um, the esteemed historian, novelist, columnist, essayist, uh, I think I can basically keep going on and on and on. But uh, most importantly for us, a lover of cricket and uh, one of the most interesting writers, I would say, on cricket, Mukul Kesavan. Hi, Mukul. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hi, Siddharth. Hi, Mahesh. It's lovely to be here. It's, uh, it's a podcast I follow avidly and it's a great privilege to be on it. Thank you, Mukul. It's a great privilege to have you. And uh, I must say, I was, uh, I mean, I'm, most of you listening to this podcast would have already uh, read, uh, read what Mukul has written, but uh, let me just give a brief introduction. Uh, I was actually introduced to Mukul in the early 2000s when he wrote some memorable essays for Wisden Asia Cricket, a magazine that uh, used to exist back then. And, uh, and after that, I continued to read him across a wide variety of topics. Um, you know, he's uh, one of the most uh, incisive political columnists that um, is writing today. And um, I, off, I have even told him that, uh, you know, future historians will greatly benefit from his work when they try and make sense of um, the state of India today. <clears throat> and in the process, future historians will also stumble on some of his cricketing work, which are both entertaining and enriching. So uh, thank you again, Mukul. Uh, before I begin with a question, let me just remind uh, listeners that uh, we are a crowdfunded platform. So you can support us at coffee.com. That's ko-fi.com slash 81 all out. Uh, some of you have set up a recurring monthly payment. Some of you have uh, put in a one-time contribution. Anything helps because uh, this is something that we're doing in our free time. And uh, your uh, contribution is uh, you know, going to be a big benefit for us. So yeah, thank you for listening and uh, thank you for supporting. So Mukul, um, of course, I will be linking several of your articles and books uh, that you have uh, written in the show notes. And uh, one of your books uh, which the, on cricket, which I thoroughly enjoyed, was Men in White, which is a collection of essays that you wrote, uh, many of which were published in Cricket Info and other places. But uh, one of the things that really um, I enjoyed then, because I didn't associate you with that kind of writing at all, I associated you with a kind of very sharp, incisive columnist like, uh, you know, uh, writing, but suddenly I see this uh, uh, grown adult being transported into a child, going back to a Delhi where you grew up and you learned about cricket. You're writing about uh, it, it. It was it was fascinating to read. So tell us a bit about that. Your childhood. You talk you talk about this place, Pandara Park, which is uh, you know reminded me of um, uh, the famous uh, Mudville of Stephen Jay Gould when he writes about triumph and tragedy in Mudville. So, uh, and again, another book that I was introduced to thanks to your writing. So, yeah, tell us a bit about your childhood, learning cricket, playing cricket, uh, coming to the game. Uh, you know, thank you for that uh, introduction, Siddharth. Uh, I have to say that any historian who stumbles across my cricket writing in the future will have to be an archaeologist. He'll have to excavate the stuff because it will be properly buried in complete obscurity. But, you know, coming, coming to your question about... Um, uh, about sort of childhood initiation into cricket. I mean, in some ways, it's uh, no more and no less interesting than the initiation of what you could broadly call a kind of Anglophone middle class into cricket. Because uh, while cricket spans, you know, many classes in India for the longest time, you only have to read Ram Guha's magnificent corner of a foreign field to recognize that, you know, all the way from Balu, who's a Dalit in Maharashtra, to to Naidu, who's a colonel in the army. There are many, many people, kinds of people involved in cricket. But I think it'd be fair to say that the kinds of people who read, uh, you know, sports pages and listened to commentary uh, and were socialized into cricket in that way was a fairly thin sliver of a kind of wannabe Anglophone middle class. And 
you know, I remember uh, cricket first in an old Delhi neighborhood, which I grew in, in called Kashmiri Gate, where you basically played in the lanes uh, with, uh, you know, with the boys in the neighborhood who, unlike New Delhi, tended to come from a, uh, from a fairly mixed social class. Lots of them were what we would call the urban poor. But mainly my childhood memories of cricket are associated with a kind of Sarkari pastoral, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, bureaucratic New Delhi, where government servants, and both my parents worked for the state in one way or the other. My father was, uh, was a kind of librarian. My mother was uh, a sound engineer who worked for All India Radio. So we lived in what the English call grace and favor housing. We lived in, in, government, uh, in government houses. And government houses had the great uh, privilege of being expansively endowed with greens. So you had these magnificent, magnificent parks, which were a kind of invitation uh, to cricket. So, and I think this was the experience of lots of people, but it was a peculiar experience in that it led to nothing in the sense that it wasn't part of, uh, you know, a Kanga league. It wasn't part of a league like the Bangalore leagues with its many tiers. It was just an enclosed, hermetic, insular uh, form of Sarkari communion. These kids whose parents were from the same rank of bureaucratic officer all played with each other uh, in the afternoons. And that was the limit of it. I mean, there were some of us who were more, more ambitious, not me, uh, who went off to improve their cricket through competitive school cricket and so on. But for the most part, it was the most, um, most local of... Um, uh, uh, of cricket practices. Uh, but in terms of initiation, it was that, and the fact that I think many of us have had this experience sort of enthusiastic fathers. Uh, you know, my father was, uh, uh, was much older than I was. Uh, he, you know, he was 48 when I was born. He had spent several years in England as a student, uh, trying unsuccessfully to get into the ICS and uh, doing degrees in English in the meanwhile. So my childhood was filled with these, uh, you know, rose-tinted memories of, uh, uh, of my father telling me stories about uh, watching the Indians during their first tour, uh, that famous tour in the early 30s, where he said he followed them about. And uh, he spoke of watching the English play the Australians. He spoke of, you know, in the way that Half the time, I'm, I'm not sure whether he remembered this or whether he remembered himself remembering this. So he would talk about Dilip Sinji walking out to play, wearing a cream silk shirt, billowing out behind him. And he, he was lovely. He was a great storyteller. But after he told this to you, you know, after he told you the story for the 10th time, you began to wonder whether the billowing out was a kind of romantic whimsy that, you know, a lot of us read experiences that we then internalize into uh, our memories. And I think my father did watch a lot of cricket, but in his telling of it, it became a kind of idyll. I hugely enjoyed it. I mean, cricket for me was always, was never a choice. It was a kind of spectatorial destiny. It's, it's interesting that you talk about uh, remembering the memory because uh, I don't know why, for some reason, when you spoke about this billowing out, the shirt billowing out, I thought of this very, like when I was probably... 14 or something, I picked up this book of cricketing sketches. I don't even know who wrote it. It had these small uh, one para descriptions of people. And in one of them was this uh, Sri Lankan batsman. I mean, of course, it was Ceylon then, this batsman, Mahadevan Satasivam. And uh, one of the, I, I still remember, the, I don't know what they wrote about his batting, but the description was that he wore the cap at a rakish angle. And that's all I remember. Yeah. And uh, who knows whether he wore the cap at a rakish angle or not. But for me, when I think of Mahadevan Satasivam, he wore a cap at a rakish angle. So this is it. Rakish is one of uh, one of the great uh, journalistic adjectives of cricketing law. So uh, the Nawab wore his cap at a rakish angle, and uh, you know if Jaisima had worn a cap, people would have said that he wore it at a rakish angle. I think rakish just signified a kind of kind of swag, a kind of uh, you know a kind of stylishness. And uh, that's the lovely thing, actually, about cricketing law. It comes down to you in sort of cliché and platitudes that are raised above cliché and platitudes simply because they're remembered so passionately and so fondly that you're willing to forgive, 
you know, the baseness of the currency in which they are expressed. And, and you're willing to forgive the exaggeration also. I mean, Amar Singh coming off the pitch like the crack of doom. I mean, wonderful, <laughs> isn't it? Just a <laughs> spectacular metaphor. So good. It's, it's yeah. just stuck in my head. I'm like, and then after a point of time, of course, I'm like, what the hell is this crack of doom? But it's great. <laughs> and you know, the first thing you think of in the context of uh, being a kind of cricketing couch potato is you think, yeah, if Amar Singh was bowling today, and if you were looking at the speed gun, who knows, it might be 118 or something, you know? So there's this, there's this strange post facto skepticism uh, built into the way in which you receive uh, sort of legendary law. But a part of you hopes that all of it is true. <laughs> yeah, in a way, I'm glad that there aren't that many videos of Gundapa Vishwanath online because uh, Indian uncles of the, uh, you know, a certain vintage may just, <laughs> may, may just uh, have nothing to say after that when, they, when we well, see him know, edging and fumbling. <laughs> the thing is that you never saw Vishwanath edging and fumbling for the simple reason that he never edged or fumbled. <laughs> and, you know, uh, Indian uncles like me who, who actually watched, you know, I watched the second test that Vishwanath played it. This was the Delhi test against the Australians. He had scored his century. It was, was it Kanpur? I think it was Kanpur. Yeah. And I remember this idiot commentator, I forget who he was. In the first innings, he was batting um, and he, sa- he was batting with Patodi. And he said, well, he's batting in the company of his captain, which is a great thing. And of course he was out for a duck. And then in the next innings, he scored a hundred. And the next test was the Delhi test. So, um, I remember we, my brother and I went to uh, watch, it, watch it at Kotla and we won the test. And we won it with, I think, Vishwanath not out 40 something and Wadekar made a kind of 90. And, you know, for my brother and I, it was sort of love at first sight. Uh, just to watch, uh, you know, this magical person who looked like, you know, if you cut Graham Gooch in half, you'd have a kind of Vishwanath. You know, he had the sort of, handlebar moustache, except that he was half his size. But he was, you know, uh, for someone who seemed to, who, oh, if, if you had done a kind of diagram of his shots, all of them would be square either side of the wicket. I don't think I can remember him hit straight at all. But it was so idiosyncratically beautiful, you know. Um, and as he got tubbier and tubbier, it became just more and more attractive. I mean, it, it, it was like, it was like it was like watching this extraordinarily skilled and beautiful teddy bear, you know, play cricket in the middle. He was just wonderful. I won't hear a word against him. Yeah, of course. And every single edge of Vishwanath was only a cut. It was a late, late, was, late yeah. cut. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have I've often thought about this that um, you know when we learn to <clears throat> when we begin to uh, love the game and be introduced to it is also when we are many of us are playing it in like the park or in the gully and for me personally and for few people around who have asked around the players who they were most drawn to are the players who they could not imitate in their backyard basically like when i used to try and bat like azruddin i used to fail so miserably that i began to ad- my admiration of azruddin just went up several notches because how, how can you take that ball from uh, eighth stump and then hit it to square? I mean, wh- how, how does one even do that, uh, even in like the most amateur setting? So is there, is there something to that? You know, I can't speak to that firsthand because I never watched my adolescent heroes play. Uh, there was no television. You could, yeah. I remember uh, Buddhashan at some point after the 71 West Indies tour, uh, showed, a, I think, a 26-minute package of highlights that covered the entire series, which looked as if it had been shot by a blind cameraman with a mobile phone. You know, you could, there was nothing, you, you just watched this, but we watched worshipfully because, you know, it was, uh, it was the only, it was the only motion, motion picture visuals we'd actually seen of cricket. The only, cri- the first time I remember watching Cricket Live must have been in, I don't know, the early or mid-70s. Uh, because I don't think there are live matches shown before that in India. And I remember, in fact, in 1978, when, uh, when Bedi took our team to Pakistan for the revival of, uh, uh, of cricket, 
I was really gripped by this sense of technological inferiority because Pakistan television actually showed bloody replays. You know, uh, all the cricket I had seen was A, only shot from one end. There was no question that, you know, you only watch the batsman front on from one end because that's where the camera was. And there were no replays. So Pakistan television showed replays, not slow motion replays. I mean, the snick was just as fast the second time around, but at least you knew what had happened. So I never actually got to watch Gavaskar or Vishwanath bat uh, at the point where I still had cricketing aspirations, which were cruelly and swiftly snuffed out because my hand-eye coordination didn't exist. And, uh, you know, you realized early that you couldn't, you couldn't sort of pad up without a pad. So my entire aim was to get my shins out of the line of the ball, which is not the best way of, of batting. And of course, nobody was interested in bowling. I mean, who bowled? So by the time I had any cricketing ambitions of my own, uh, I never, ha you know, you didn't have models to imitate. I'm always astonished by how beautifully young people who I watch playing in a local maidan, how wonderfully they mimic, mimic worn uh, and people they've watched. I mean, they literally know what to do. But we didn't actually know what they did. I mean, uh, the only thing you had was, uh, you know, the back pages of a newspaper or sport and pastime. I remember cutting out photographs, color pictures and sticking them in, in chart paper albums. But there was, uh, there was no motion picture loveliness to imitate. Well, well, Munkul, you didn't know exactly what they did, but you knew something more fantastical. You knew, you, you sort of had the imagination of what they did. You, you could imagine what they did. Yeah, we, yeah that, you know, that's actually true. Um, it's very hard, though, to imagine uh, Budhi Kunduran scoring 192 uh, against the English in Madras when the only image you have is of him propped up on his front foot, you know, stretching and looking back at his wickets because he's been bold. I mean, you know, uh, you want... With with engineer, uh, in contrast, you knew because everybody told you that he batted like a hurricane. And uh, I remember him, uh, I think it, this was the test against Australia and Delhi. And I don't think he got many, but you could see that he was like, uh, he was like a kind of uh, proto Sehwag, you know, not, not of that level of accomplishment, but uh, certainly, that kind of lunatic zest. Uh, he was he was wonderful, and he was also this great charismatic figure. You know, Brill Cream with his shirt buttons undone, and uh, this wonderfully good-looking man. You know, who'd sort of swagger out to play. So, uh, you know, engineer opening uh, really quickened the pulses of of my cohort. Yeah, I mean, uh, I did a podcast with. Um, a a gentleman called Jay Galgali, who uh, has been doing a great service to Indian cricket by uploading the Films Division videos yeah. on YouTube. And, uh, you know, seeing those videos of uh, cricket matches in the 60s and 70s, it strikes me that what a remarkable event a test match or even a Ranji Trophy match must have been at that time. I mean, you had this huge crowds of people, you know, yeah, so many women, so many women sitting there and watching and then people smoking in the stands and this whole, it's a carnival. I mean, the, talk a bit about that. I mean, I don't think because, we can even uh, relate you know, to that. Uh, I feel a sense of real deprivation whenever people talk about this because, uh, you know, we were Delhi bound. We lived in Delhi. And, uh, and uh, there's no good way of putting it uh, uh, the Virusha Kotla is, is a bog. It's always been a bog. It's a, it's a grotesque and hideous stadium. Uh, it's a nightmare to park there. Uh, the policemen that, uh, that process you are sadists. There are no facilities. I remember going to Chepok to watch uh, the, uh, uh, the great third test against the Australians uh, after Lakshman's heroics in the second test. And I spent five glorious days watching cricket there. And I couldn't believe that I didn't need a visa to come to Madras because here was this ground where you could drive in the civilized way to a car park. You could go unmolested into the stadium. The bathrooms were like something out of 
a second tier airport uh, you could actually eat everything from an uttapam to a pizza served perfectly hygienically by people who looked as if they were in the food business and weren't actually thugs taken off the street it was miraculous but you know kota was horrible i mean let's let's just admit this it was a dreadful place to watch cricket there was a kind of stub of the past which was the willingdon pavilion which was a small not particularly distinguished pavilion but it was because it was colonial at least it wasn't as monstrous as the rest of kota so most of my cricket was watched uh on the on the concrete steps uh, which were actually great seats because if you came in early enough you uh, they weren't numbered so you could get in quite close to the side screen and it was quite astonishing you know you uh, you had to get up at 5 in the morning to actually get in with any chance of not watching this match from square leg or something you know and it it was winter so you take a light blanket you take a transistor radio because you wanted to listen to the match you know you wanted to listen to chakrapani and pierce and surita and the people who uh, you know that was the other thing because you listen listen to english commentary because you were in in thrall to english i mean this is the slightly pathetic sort of post colonial world in which uh, learning cricket was also uh, by a curious bypass the process of being socialized into english so you'd you'd be listening and it was it was wonderful you took your own food because you know uh, if you ate anything there you'd probably die uh, it was so but you were young you know it didn't it didn't matter it was and then as you grew older you uh, uh, life improved because in delhi as you grow older within the middle classes you get to know people who know people uh, because nothing in delhi happens like an honest transaction where someone announces there are tickets being sold you go to the ticket window and you buy the ticket you can afford no 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 that would be too simple so i've watched lots of matches from uh, kotla's entirely undistinguished members enclosure a completely free uh, thanks to a friend who was the nephew of rat singh dungarpur so we would uh, we would swagger into this place and and watch uh, pretending we were to the manner born but actually it wasn't that much more comfortable than the concrete steps on the other side because kotla as a whole was so rudimentary that uh, it didn't matter really where you watched the match from you know whichever way you sliced it it was still below me it's interesting that uh, two points though one is that uh, the the chennai test that you attended um was also i think mahesh's first experience of live cricket yeah that is my first oh, really? uh, yeah international <laughs> match at uh, at a ground oh so you were the ground too Yeah, for four days. I missed the first day because I was writing my board exams. Uh, but for the rest of the four days, oh I was there. Oh my god! So you, so your board exams ended, and you watched the next four days. Uh, no, and uh, not really ended. Yeah, one. Of, uh, I still had one more exam. I watched half of the days. Uh, so first day I missed the complete one because it was a Sunday, and the next day was my math exam. And my parents, even my parents, wouldn't allow me because my math scores were pretty poor. So I finished so the math exam. The came, yeah, I finished the math exam. Came back for the post lunch session. and the next day i wrote the accounting exam came back for the post lunch session the last uh, two days over the full days so you I mean, literally <laughs> you were literally i mean you your parents must have been extraordinarily enlightened because the thought that you could use up time intermediate between two examinations for the sublime purpose of watching cricket is not something my parents would have uh, i mean i was almost certainly stupider than you at doing examinations but that's amazing that you actually watch post lunch sessions with an exam in, pro- in prospect yeah in fact amal uh, if it was not for the math exam I, I, i think i would have gotten away with the sunday as well i think only math they were worried about <laughs> any other exam they were not worried about i'm I, actually looking back at it i'm i'm shocked like even even after that the first reasonable job i had like i went to england to watch the disastrous 2011 series and uh, like four months later i went to australia to watch the disa- even more disastrous uh, australia series and they were pretty okay with it i'm i'm quite surprised and and my dad wasn't particularly a massive cricket fan all he remembers is four things about about cricket you know he remembers sandeep patel's uh, glorious innings uh, in in uh, australia and and the one against bob willis but otherwise i don't i mean he was a cricket fan but not that keen so i'm always surprised by how okay they were with my cricket obsession i think it tells us something about the standing of cricket in uh, in middle class households i mean there was a sense in which it you know for example my grandmother if she saw me reading a novel 
और इवन माई मदर समाइम से इन हिंदी अरे क्या नॉवल बाजी कर रहा है नॉवल बाजी वॉज यू नो इट वॉज ऑलमोस्ट इज इफ इट वॉज अ फॉर्म ऑफ लफंगा डेकडेंस दैट यू नो वॉट इज दिस यूर डूइंग बट स्ट्रेंगली ना क्रिकेट वॉज रिस्पेक्टेबल इन अ वे दैट अदर ट्रिवियल पर्स्यूट्स वर नॉट it depends on the family mukul my my family uh, always felt that uh, i completely wasted my childhood on watching so much cricket <laughs> because simply because neither of my parents were interested in cricket and for them yeah. it was always like a side show that was happening well and they were like you this boy is waking up at 5 in the morning to watch a test match from australia but will not wake up at 5 in the morning to do his uh, homework <laughs> Yeah I think um, I think my father was a very benevolent presence I also had the great advantage of having an older brother who had pioneered all these things so he was like this a crazed radio buff who used to just uh, just as a kind of hobby tune in to obscure radio stations uh so you know radio south africa well before we knew anything of apartheid and uh finding be, you know finding test match special was a great challenge because right next to it would be radio peace and progress which had gigantic transmitters because the soviets just took up all the bandwidth that was available so you would have uh, these perfectly posh kadlas english accents but which were actually soviet uh, broadcasters constantly nudging you know the thin thread of test match special of the airwaves so sudhakar my brother had actually prepared the ground for this so the whole business of of tuning in in the morning um uh, and listening to cricket all that hard work had been done for me uh partly by my father but mainly by uh by virtue of being a younger brother so uh no i'm very struck by the fact that mahesh and i who are separated by a generation actually share uh, uh the madras test i think i was meant to write a piece for the hindu on the match and i did but uh one of the last things you actually want to do is write about a match that you've enjoyed i mean uh, to a deadline it's one thing if you if you if you write about it uh in uh in a spirit of uh sort of unbelievable benevolent trolling as i often do uh, after i watch a match from uh from sofa but uh, a match that you watch from the stadium is a sacred thing you know to write about it is a penance you know uh, a batsman like nilesh kulkarni who was to bat at number 11 who didn't bat in the end but who was to come in he was sitting there waiting padded up in the and and he says that the uh, dressing room area was very close to the members enclosure and how he was overhearing people trying to talk to him and say that nilesh in the tight test in 86 maninder singh was the last man he was also a left arm spinner just like you <laughs> and he didn't uh, survive and it ended up being a tie so please don't do that and nilesh kulkarni is like these guys at this point of time are still drawing on <laughs> historical parallels <laughs> kcc uh, for no reason for, 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 for no reason <laughs> yeah so I mean, that's a hashtag for knowledgeable cricket fan that, yeah knowledgeable you know, yeah, knowledgeable chennai? chennai crowd as oh, yeah, we sorry. call them yeah kcc they are knowledgeable for a reason <laughs> no but it, it has to be said that i know these things are are played up and romanticized but uh it still gives me goose flesh to think that when we lost to pakistan that you know there was a there was a desi crowd uh, that took it well i mean that is genuinely nice it's just nice to know i mean it it might always happen it might it might also spring from ancient experience in defeat but for what is worth it's still good no the the thing about that match which also i had written a piece about uh, was that one of the spectators there told me a very interesting thing one of the spectators who is also a good friend of mahesh he told me an interesting thing he said when the defeat happened there were a couple of people in the stands who uh, started who threw something into the ground like like a plastic uh, thing or something uh, not dangerous but they threw something into the ground in anger but there were this whole bunch of people that then admonished them and said that stop it they have, this has been a great match they watched it and then the whole clapping started so he said that was for me uh, an example of you know you call up you call this mob mentality where people lynch others but there is also this reverse where you have this mob support that drowns out those who support. so that i think was a very interesting dynamic that happened in that match yeah i can't see it happening in uh, in many other grounds uh, in india though i mean it's inconceivable that would happen in firosha kota 
You know, uh, I, I'm trying to think of an image of, of depravity, of cricketing depravity. And uh, the one that comes to mind is the first IPL season. Uh, so you remember the first match was, I think, Bangalore, where there was that magnificent century scored by... Brendan uh, McCallum. Uh, Brendan McCallum. And so I decided, you know, I just decided I would watch the second match in Kotla. This is partly because I had a kind of completely unearned, but yet proprietorial interest in this sort of franchise cricket. Because in one of my more fantastical moments, I had fantasized that, you know, this was probably the turn of the century, maybe 2001 or 2002. I wrote a piece uh, thinking that wouldn't it be great if first class cricket was franchised so that the working cricketer was worthy of his hire so that, you know, we could have a league like an English football league, which would be a career of all the talents. And I remember dreaming of kind of Infosys Cup with the Mumbaikars led by Ricky Ponting and so on. So I thought, well, it's not the, it's not the format that I expected, but still, you know, it is, it is franchise cricket. So I bought myself a ticket and, uh, and I, went to, uh, I went to the ground, uh, which was even more awful than usual because it was after dark. I mean, can you imagine Firusha Kotla after dark? In daytime, it's, you know, it's frightening enough. After dark, it's like uh, a Dante-esque hellscape. So I go to this place and I remember, I think I remember briefly meeting um, that other cricket fanatic, uh, Rajiv Sardesai, who was there with his then young sons and he'd come along to, to sample this as well. And I remember getting in and I had quite, you know, I had quite good seats. You cannot believe the grotesqueness of it. I mean, uh, in a way, that, in a way uh, you know, I, I feel bad about this because if it hadn't been as grotesque, maybe I would have been, you know, maybe I'd have given uh, the IPL, uh, you know, a longer sort of workout as a fan. So you go there and first, I think you have some curious spectacle where I think it was, if I remember right, Akshay Kumar roped up on a kind of pulley, sort of swooping down a rope for no reason that anybody could understand. So that was the beginning of it. And then the most horrific thing of all was there was this pinjara, you know, there was this cage this large cage where, uh, where women, uh, mainly blonde white women uh, in tinsel, were, were dancing to the delectation of Delhi's cricketing patrons. I mean, it's hard to believe a more horrifying scenario within the context of cricket. It literally was uh, a kind of lascivious nightmare. You know, um, so I think anybody who's skeptical about cricket in Chepok should count their blessings. I mean, you know, at least you didn't have to grow up in Delhi. Huh. And I, I mean, now you make me feel like a first world complainer because wow, one of the recurring themes when I used to blog was the fact that Indian ground experience is so horrible. And my my samples were Chepok, Bangalore and Mumbai. And, and after listening to your Delhi stories, I should consider myself extremely fortunate. No, I mean, uh, so if you're a woman... You couldn't till, I mean, I'm sure things have changed now, but uh, I remember taking my wife and my children off to watch a, a one-day international, I think in 20, 2001. And uh, after a while, we had to leave because uh, uh, their toilets weren't fit for human consumption, for human female consumption at any rate. So, you know, uh, it was a nightmare. I don't know what it's like now. I mean... Uh, it would, I mean, there are, there are circumstances in which I would go to watch a match in Kotla now, but they would have to be very exceptional ones. Yeah, so uh, one of the themes that came up when I was uh, writing about the Chennai test is that Mahesh was talking about how, because it was his first experience of an international match, uh, how, uh, you know, he still so vividly recalls the first, the moment he saw Lakshman 
play a certain shot and you know that that memory of just watching somebody in the flesh for the first time watching such a gorgeous batsman that leaves such an imprint on on us and you know for us uh most of that experience for our generation i mean is that we very very rarely go to an international match without having seen that player already uh on television but for you uh, it would have been so much more different because i mean i think you had written a piece uh, about imran khan when you you know saw him bowl for the first time and the sort of sensations that it must have triggered would have been so different than had you watched him before i mean um i remember in uh, i mean of course the first time i watched uh, imran khan bowl was on television in 78 uh, in black and white uh, sitting in delhi but the next time i saw him bowl was when i was a student in england i remember going off on as it happened i think the 14th of august which is pakistan's national day uh, going off to watch an england uh, pakistan test match at uh, at lords and it it was that famous match where you know where they nearly pulled it out i think it was mudassar mudassar nazar and Imran, I forget the details in it, of it, but they were basically done in by just appalling umpiring. Uh, there was there was this umpire who was a kind of bogeyman as far as South Asian teams was, uh, were concerned, a man called uh, David Constant, and uh, I remember all of us gasping when he gave I don't know who it was, Sikandar Bakht or Mudas uh, or Mudassar Nazar out, because we all claimed, um, sitting as we were. to be fair to us uh, directly opposite uh, by the side screen we all claimed you could tell from that distance that there must have been 6 inches between the ball and the bat but you know in the end it was just partisanship but he was also i think um, he, he was also a reason why uh, neutral umpires uh, were a good idea which is not which is not to say he was not neutral it was certainly the case that there seemed to be more perverse decisions made on his watch than most others but you know going back to watching great cricketers play watching imran bowl i remember the first thing that i was astonished about was a how absurdly high that delivery leap was and how far out how far wide he went you know and then he would then you would see this ball sort of banana in this in swinger move what seemed like a yard it was just quite astonishing how much uh you know pakistani fast bowlers brought the ball in and to watch imran doing it uh you know sort of greek god style at speed was like one of these heroic epic moments in spectatorship it was quite it was quite extraordinary i can imagine what uh, mahesh must have felt like watching uh, uh watching watching lakshman say drive inside out out of the rough it was uh, just pure magic actually I think this this is the point where we should make a case in the absence of Kartikeya for uh, for for an for an uh, for an aesthetic defense of Lakshman. You know, my um, my father, who was an unapologetic Vishwanath partisan, uh, perversely would say to me that you know uh, my god was uh, was and is. uh is gavaskar uh, you know the player i hasten to add so uh my father would say with you know with the perverseness that only the very old can sort of get away with he would say that you know i would take take a train to watch vishwanath i wouldn't i wouldn't cross a road to watch your accumulating gavaskar which was so grotesquely unfair you know gavaskar was one of the most perfect batsman in the world to watch i still watch him on youtube you know i i try to get my son to watch him on on youtube because i've never seen such you know such neat perfection you know i i look at him play and i feel uh, you know god's in his is in his heaven all's right for the world there was a kind of and i used to look at my father open mouthed but i think there is a case for saying that and it's a case that you know people who like test cricket inevitably make Uh, brightly or wrongly which is there is something to be said for memorableness you know um, it's an unfair thing because uh, you know many were the times when lakshman 
uh, Lakshman failed and didn't deliver. But you don't remember those. What you remember are the times when, you know, he burst into sort of gorgeous life. You know, uh, do you remember that first century he scored in that pointless match which we lost? I mean, it was a pointless century. I think he scored 160. 167. In Australia, 167. And he stood up tall and he played those magnificent cross-batted, you know, pull shots and hook shots. And you looked at him worshipfully and said, you know, mine eyes have seen that uh, I've never seen a Desi bat like this before. You know, it, it was sort of recognizably Desi and yet, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and yet sort of robust. And I have to say, uh, in defense of Lakshman, uh, and with apologies to Rahane, who is ever going to remember a Rahane innings in those terms? You know, if Shubman Gill uh, actually lives up to his early promise, well, if he actually doesn't sputter out in some dramatic way, I mean, it's clear that, uh, you know, it's like, uh, uh, it's like watching, and not just because of the way he looks, but just because of the way he looks when he, when he moves into a shot. You know, it's like watching uh, Gregory Peck take guard. Why wouldn't you remember him? And you know, this is this is just completely unfair to someone who uh, who is as or more effective uh, than uh, than Gill, but just doesn't look as beautiful. And I think that was my father's point that there was magic to what uh, what Vishwanath did, and absurdly he thought that Gavaskar was workmanlike. No, but Gavaskar was a far more substantial batsman. And so was yes. Lakshman, actually. So Lakshman doesn't need the aesthetic defense at all. He was a substantial ba- batsman yeah. on its own. Just, just one more point of, on Lakshman aesthetics, which, which Sidney mentioned was, you know, while I had seen Lakshman before my first sort of uh, uh, real, you know, on the ground experience, but unlike others, like i had seen Sachin before, I'd seen Robert before, and I saw them at the ground. But unlike the others, uh, there was a very unique sort of the third dimensional experience that, that you get with Lakshman, which is which you don't see on TV. Like if you think you've seen Lakshman at his most elegant best on TV and you've not seen him on the ground, I think you've not seen the seen all of Lakshman. I mean, I've, I've read about it on papers. Like Greg Chappell always says that he's the best, you know, he's the most elegant batsman to watch at the ground. And some of the, some of the other Aussie cricketers have said he's, he's a 360 degree batsman. I didn't understand what they meant till I went there. And, and of course it helps that it was my first experience, but just to watch Lakshman bat against spin in that test, is something I'll never forget in my life, and that's also because it was unique to watch at the ground. He was his his, his artistry, his aesthetic pleasure, is is probably that much more when you watch him at the ground than even what you get on TV. I think you're uh, I think you're right. I think he scored a couple of sixties in that in that match, yeah, right? Yeah. In fifties, uh, yeah. he got a sixty-five. Yeah, he got a fifty in each uh, yeah, in yeah. each innings, and I think this must partly to do with the fact that there's something almost. Uh, absurdly exaggerated by, uh, y- you know, the amount of ground he covered uh, while playing shots. I mean, uh, not only did he step out, he stepped around and out. I mean, there was, uh, and you could probably uh, watch this and appreciate it better from square leg than you could front on, because that would sort of flatten uh, what was happening. But, you know, talk, I mean, just saying that you said this sort of 3D effect. I haven't watched Root at the ground. You know, uh, I've only watched him on television. But watching him on television, I get the sense that uh, he seems to exist uh, as a batsman in those three dimensions. You know, because uh, you know because of his back foot play, because he seems to go back and occasionally move forward. There seems to be a, a range of shot making, and he has. You know, uh, you know, I know. Uh, I'm no analyst, but there's a kind of springiness to the a kind of bounciness to the way in which he plays, uh, uh, a kind of light heeledness, which gives you the sense that he inhabits a kind of large cube, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the crease. Uh, you know, country-wise, when I watch uh, when I get when I watch Kohli, Kohli, I think that he he occupies a smaller one, because one of the things that I unreasonably miss about about batting when Kohli bats is that, uh, you know, in what I think of as the coming of age of my cricket watching, uh, when Gavaskar and Vishwanath and many, many others played, all Indian batsmen cut and square cut. You know, they went back in the cross and this, and there was a kind of josh 
to the square cutting. You know, when, uh, when Vishwanath laid one uh, past Gali or through point, you knew that, you know, it was a done deal. It was gone. And there's, there's something interesting about Kohli's batting that, uh, you know, magnificent though it is, it occurs so exaggeratedly uh, so far ahead, A, of the crease and B, on the front foot, that it's almost as if it's a different kind of batsmanship. A couple of things. One is that, um, you know, the Lakshman point, what struck me when Mahesh was talking about watching Lakshman live in 3D and watching it, is that one of the things on TV is that, especially while watching a batsman, while watching a bowler, you pretty much get the whole action. But when watching a batsman, you, he plays the shot and then you have that second camera angle to show you where the ball is going. So there is that distortion in your mind of you, you're not able to gauge exactly what has happened. But in the ground, you can see the ball going onto the bat and then going on. And then you can actually gauge the time that it has taken. And for a batsman like Lakshman, it was quite astonishing for me to realize that with the ease with which he was playing that push and then the speed with which the ball was going to the boundary, that, that's just a remarkable thing to watch. And your brain takes a moment to process that and that the processing of it brings a tremendous joy. So that was one thing that really struck me when watching a batsman like Lakshman or, you know, many of these artists, as we call them, uh, who, who make it seem so simple, but who are actually like, the ball is actually like ferociously racing away to the boundary. That is one. The other point was, of course, when you mentioned Gavaskar, you know, I have this, uh, I have an uncle who, uh, like you, was like a Gavaskar worshipper almost. To an extent where, you know, he he told me once that, you know, see, all cricket is all fine. It's all good. But, you know, when watching Gavaskar, it, for him, it was the meditative space. For that, that was it. Like, for him, it was not like a joy or it wasn't like something that he did for the sake of uh, entertainment. He did it for the sake of meditation because he felt that that Man. was Gavaskar. Zen. That was Gavaskar. For, for him, Gavaskar was, as you mentioned, that incredible balance, that that sort of perfect getting into position. And I think you've written about it as well, where you, you've said how how easy everything was about that, that, that whole immaculateness about Gavaskar. So you must tell us a bit about it, because I never saw Gavaskar at his peak. I saw him only very late in his career. So, yeah, please. You know... Um... You know, we returned to uh, to Kotla, unfortunately. Uh, this was... Uh, Marshall had come with the West Indies. And uh, I think in the first test, or maybe... I don't know whether the Delhi test was the third test, the second test. It was one of those. But he had sorted out Gavaskar in short order. I mean, he was bowling just ferociously fast. He was at the peak of his career, and uh, he was frightening. So... We went off to Kotla to watch Gavaskar with, you know, our hearts in our mouths. And he, uh, the first, the second or third ball, he hits this really nervy hook, hook shot, which is so unusual for Gavaskar because, you know, Gavaskar always swayed away or ducked. And he hits this sort of slightly uppish hook shot for four. At least this is how I remember this. And then he gets to a uh, hundred in less than even time. You know, he hits this spectacular 100. I don't think much happens in the match, but uh, he hits this 100. You know, granted that Kotla was probably uh, not exactly a green pitch, but this was Marshall bowling very quick against someone whom uh, he had under the cosh. And it was quite wonderful to watch this man with those ridiculous little, you know, those fiberglass ears he used to wear, the little band with, these things drooping down like, you know, Spaniel's ears and, you know, and his hat. There was something genuinely both extraordinarily skilled and indomitable to him, you know, about him. It was, uh, he was a genuinely middle-class hero because he, uh, you know, I've written this, uh, he made us feel solvent, you know, because uh, Indian cricket was always on the verge of losing its deposit in, uh, you know, in the late 60s and early 70s. And then this man comes to town and he opens the batting. And there's something epic about him. I remember uh, when Asif Iqbal uh, came to tour uh, after the 78 series, he, he came over and Imran was uh, 
at his you know fast bowling uh, best and uh, you know i'm in kotla we keep returning returning to this nightmare i mean i'm in kotla watching imran bowl, bowl to to gavaskar and he bowls these four or five short over length balls which you know as the classic template would have it rearing up to the heart and gavaskar literally plays them with one hand because he's too short to actually get up to and then i think imran does his hamstring and we all breathe a collective sigh of relief because you know it means that the odds for the series have improved but all my memories of of gavaskar uh, which are without question sort of romanticized over time because you know these are the matches i remember this is not a conspectus of his career our images of this i mean uh, uh, i remember him uh, on his way to his 220th the oval i'm at the university and i'm uh, i have a i don't have a radio i get into what in delhi is called a mudrika which is the bus that goes around the ring road uh, some smart ass thought that the sanskrit word for ring would be a good name for a, a uh you know uh for a bus service but it's uh, there's a kind of weird camaraderie even in delhi you know we're in this bus and there are people listening to those tiny little things these tiny transistor radios and you're sort of leaning into them trying to catch up on this because you think that we might actually win and then of course we don't because he falls and then we scratch out this draw but i mean uh, uh, my uh i remember i once met um i once met uh, patodi in the uh, in the uh, uh, company of the person i knew was his friend abbas ali beg so we once met casually and uh, you know deferentially i was listening to the talk about cricket and uh, i unwisely enthused about uh, about gavaskar so uh, uh, visabhi tendulkar i mean not not suggesting he was better but suggesting that there were two great batsmen so patavdi shook his head impatiently and said no no there's no comparison i mean tendulkar is without question you know uh, just in a in a class of his own uh, and you know much as i worship patavdi I, i have to say that uh, uh, you know i had to respectfully though silently disagree <laughs> the thing with gavaskar i mean uh, the bits i've seen in youtube and thankfully there are now uh, uploaders who are uploading entire passages of uh, play like they are up- almost uploading like uh, a whole day's play which you can you know watch uh, over like maybe not like the every ball but you can watch almost every over and uh, there was one such game in which gavaskar's uh, G- one such gavaskar innings that was there and even while watching on youtube on grainy youtube it strikes me that he he basically played the ball or he left the ball uh you know but the from the moment in which the bowler was running in you know he basically he's watching the ball right through he's watching the ball uh, past him he's watching the ball to the keeper if he has left the ball then he is watching the ball from the keeper to the slip to the second slip to the fielder back to the bowler and then he takes this quick glance around the field he sometimes does his counting and then he again takes card and then the next ball happens and he does the same thing now this repetitive quality has something to it i mean you don't notice that in cricket these days at all um, you know very 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 few batsmen have this kind of this whole thing happening again and again and again there is there is definitely something mesmeric about just sitting and watching a gavaskar innings i mean and i completely understood what my uncle was saying when he said it was zen i mean this is just music to my ears because the loveliest thing about gavaskar's innings were not necessarily the shots he played it was the setup you know like you said that he'd look around and then there would be that precise perfectly repeated set of three movements he would plant his right foot on the ground and then his left and then he would tap with the bat and he'd look up and when he left the ball alone it was a kind of minor art form because you know his his back foot would you know would go across his front foot would join in and his hands would click upstairs with the bat held in a perfect vertical above his head i mean it was almost as if the whole thing had been put on an assembly line and set into perfect mechanical motion you know to leave a ball alone with that kind of magical crispness i mean hark at me gosh it's like uh, uh, you know 
But even the non-doing cricket bits of Gavaskar was so perfect. Yeah, like, I mean, he, leaving, I mean, Gavaskar was, had this famous leave where the ball used to basically graze his armpits. No, this, yeah, and yeah, yeah. they used to go. And how many batsmen do that these days? Almost nobody. Because they're either ducking or, you know, and with the helmet, they also have this certain mechanical way of leaving the ball. But Gavaskar found these new ways of dancing around the ball almost. You know, uh, one of the things that I think we should uh, we should pay more, uh, pay more attention to in two ways. I mean, especially when we... Uh, play this game of comparing batsmen uh, uh, across periods is is to just think that you couldn't have a Virat Kohli without a helmet. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't practice that technique. You couldn't stand a yard outside uh, outside your crease if you didn't have a helmet on. You know, in one of these pointless uh, arguments that you constantly had with your friends about relative merits, uh, when things got really down and dirty. I would say, how many times have you seen Gauska hit in the head? And my follow-up question was, how many times have you seen Tendulkar pinged? You know, because the fact of the matter is that once the helmet turns up, through no fault of the batsman, they don't have to be as fanatically careful about not being hit in the head. So consequently, they are periodically hit in the head. But it comes in useful as rhetorical argument because uh, you can always say that if we are talking about fast bowling and skill, my man never got hit in the head. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and and uh, I think you know the 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 helmet itself. I mean, the the helmet itself has brought on so much of a change. Like a batsman like Mohinder Amarnath, he says, you know, one of the reasons why I hooked was because I didn't want to get hit because I had this zone. I knew that there were certain balls I could leave, but I knew that when the ball was at my head, I had to hook, otherwise I was dead. So you know. <laughs> I remember this time when uh, uh, I, you know, again, this happened at the Kotla. Uh, uh, he was hit. And uh, I think an interval, uh, a kind of one of these T intervals ensued. And then he came out and there was a gasp in the audience because he came out wearing a solar topi. You know, those colonial pith helmets? He came out wearing a solar topi. I'm sure his father had handed it to him uh, you know, I'm sure it was Lala Amarnath's and he had given it to him in the pavilion and said, now wear it and go out. And he came out with the solar topi and uh, and you could see that he was shocked that, you know, uh, he got out soon afterwards. But once he, he got into a helmet, he was just one of our greatest batsmen against fast bowling ever. Which, you know, it's an unfair thing to say, but I will make the argument that there were people who were just so good that they could do this without the helmet. Now, this, of course, describes the generality of all players who played before the helmet. But we also know what, for example, if you think of Brijesh Patel, Brijesh Patel was a genuinely gifted batsman. You know, he was a genuinely first-rate attacking Ranji batsman. But he had a difficulty, like, uh, like Mohinder did, with the short ball. And perhaps if he had, you know, played in the era of the helmet, he would have been a genuine tiger because he was a very, very high, highly rated, uh, uh, you know, Ranji Trophy player. And I'm sure there are many, many people like that. So I think, I don't think we should make a meal out of this, but I think it's useful historically to give credit to people who were geniuses at batting against very fast bowling without a helmet. You did speak about radio and you did speak about playing the game at the very amateur levels. But uh, tell us a bit about your reading about the game. Uh, because, um, you know, first of all, uh, your writing strikes me as so refreshing because it is not um, rooted in the typical British grammar of English. And, um, you know, uh, by that I mean, like, you know, the terms that we discussed, like the uh, shirt billowing or the crack of doom and the sort of writing that... Uh, was, uh, you know, A.A. Thompson, Neville Cardis, that, that uh, school of writing. But uh, you seem to come from a far more, I mean, your writing is far more rooted in the Desi English. Uh, you know, you, you often throw in uh, Indianisms and Indian terms. You often compare. Your, your analogies are very, uh, very Indian. Um, if, if I don't know if I'm even explaining it right. But tell us a bit about your influences in cricket writing or was it more your influences in just other writing that you brought into cricket? Uh, who did you read when you were growing up, etc.? 
You know, uh, the earliest cricket books I can remember reading, uh, my college library had uh, a copy of his Singleton's uh, uh, great book on Bradman. And then I found a copy of his earlier book. Uh, I think if I remember right, it was called Cricket Crisis. This is about the body line series, which is a genuinely magnificent piece of writing. And Singleton, uh, you know, from that period, from, you know, the period that I think of as well before my time, I think Fingleton is the writer I admire above all others, partly because, you know, he's a very fine player himself, partly because of the, of the kind of uh, electricity around his writing because of his long feud with Bradman. In this very mean-spirited aside, Bradman once writes that uh, once O'Reilly and, um, and Fingleton passed on, uh, he enjoyed being with the 1948 team. I mean, uh, there was real hostility between the two. So I like Fingleton very much. Uh, I can't abide Cardus. I mean, I, uh, you know, uh, I know that uh, Ram Guha, who's an old friend of mine, is a great admirer, but I can't even begin to understand why people write Cardus. I think he's an awful writer. I think to, uh, to read Cardus is to be introduced inside the covers of one book to everything that is undesirable about cricket writing. You know, it's slack, it's hyperbolic, it's imprecise, it's snobbish. And it's so strange coming from a man who himself comes from such subaltern uh, uh, origins. The weird thing about cricket is that it fancies itself as a literature. But the truth is that cricket doesn't really have a great literature. You know, uh, I don't know very much about baseball, but even a short bibliography of baseball will tell you that there's so much more writing about baseball, so much more, you know, you were talking about uh, that wonderful book of essays by Stephen Jay Gould, uh, uh, you know, Tragedy and Triumph in Mudville, this wonderful book of essays by a great mind about this sport that he passionately enjoys. Some of its chapters actually remind me of, uh, of uh, uh, Marcus here's brilliantly sort of iconoclastic, but rapier-like history of the evolution of English cricket. So, as far as I can see, all the best cricket writing that's been written has been written in my adult lifetime. You know, barring a few great, great books like uh, Beyond the Boundary, which is, uh, almost, it's almost a shibboleth to say it's a great book, but it is a great book. It is without question, it is inarguably the greatest book written with cricket as a context. Because he's a very great writer. You know, he, he was a great historian. He wrote a great history of the first uh, black revolution that was successful in Haiti. He's a genuinely great man. And he wrote a great cricket book. But put that aside and put, put aside the odd, uh, wonderful book like, uh, Crick, you know, Cricket Crisis by, by Fingleton. You know, it's a great deal of cricketing literature is either made up of trashy tour diaries or mawkish upper class, upper class sentimentalization of English cricket because so much of this garbage is produced by the English, which is why reading uh, someone like Marcusia is such a tonic because it's like an epiphany. You read him and you say, yes, that explains Brian Johnston. Of course, that's Trevor Bailey to the life. Oh, that old fart. Now I know why they behave like this. You know, it's too... To read Marcusia is to have this entire cloudy nonsense about uh, English cricketing literature sort of demystified. So all the books that I genuinely admire were written not that long ago. So, uh, you know, uh, Ram's magisterial book, which is a truly magnificent history of, of cricket, you know, his, his work on Balu, and the way in which uh, you know uh, he and his brothers struggle in the, you know, it first saw life as a great historical essay uh, in in past and present. Uh, you know the deftness with which he uses the great molds of uh, of caste and race and region uh, and communal identity to tell the story. It is a genuinely wonderful book. And then of course there's uh, uh, my you know. Uh, so the idiosyncratically personal favorite, which is anyone but England, which is like a tour de force. I mean, you could read it in two and a half hours and at the end of it, you'd be just much the wiser for it. But uh, 
interestingly, the two great cricketing novels, you know, there's a terrible novel written by Ted Dexter, some trashy detective novel called Test Kill, which I once bought from a secondhand bookshop and then threw at the wall because it was so bad. But the two great cricketing novels are both written by Sri Lankans. Uh, you know, one is uh, that wonderful uh, great baggy monster of a novel by uh, Shehan... Karunatilaka. Um, Karunatilaka, uh, yeah, which is a uh, Chinaman, which is this great, you know, Romana Clay, uh, which has everybody that you know of in cricket, including Tony Gregg under different names, you know, uh, it's, but it's this genuinely wacky and wonderful uh, novel, which it's like Sri Lankan cricket in, you know, in a multidimensional universe, in a dimension not that far removed from ours, but happening parallelly. That's a wonderful novel. And then there's this great uh, Sri Lanka, uh, novel by, very fine, short, shorter novel by Ramesh Gunasekare called The, the Match. Match. The match, yeah. which is uh, which is more political, but and it's a novel of exile as well. But uh, and then of course there's that you know, uh, I think a book that began as a tour diary, which but which transcends the genre, which is a truly brilliant, wonderful book, which is Rahul Bhattacharya's Pandits from Pakistan, which is just such a lovely book. You know, a, a book that essentially invents its own form uh, and is just a complete delight to read. And that's really it. I mean, uh, there are, uh, you know, I'm sure there are many books I haven't read. But of the books I have, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to find that um, so many of them are written by people who roughly belong to a series of cohorts in my lifetime. Of all the things that you mentioned of Neville Cardis, one of the words that you didn't describe him as, though many people have after that, is fictional. And people say that had Cardis been writing today, he would have been so, you know, skewered on social media because he was making up stuff most of the time. Half of the things that he said weren't even true. They weren't even, they didn't even match the scorecards. <laughs> so <laughs> I, that, that I don't mind. I mean, some fantasy is permitted. I mean, you have to make some stuff up. You can't, uh, you know, uh, I think I'm deeply grateful to, uh, to Stats Guru, but there's a point where, uh, you know, we are allowed dream time. So, uh, so you know, stats guru and going walkabout in your head uh, to invent things that never actually happened a little bit is on. Well, uh, Kellyanne Conway uh, spoke about the term alternative facts, but uh, long before that, Cardis spoke about the higher truth, where he said, well, he might not have said that, but he should have said that. So, <laughs> you know, actually, it's quite uh, one of, uh, uh, you know, one of the great figures uh, in my growing up was uh, was this wonderful commentator, John Arlott. When I, f you know, when I first uh, began listening to Test Match Special, I was a kind of young post-colonial idiot. So I decided that, uh, you know, Arlott's accent wasn't right because it wasn't, uh, you know, received pronunciation. And, you know, how clearly Brian Johnston speaks and look at Trevor Bailey. And then I realized, you know, in adulthood that these were like, mad reactionaries, that they were crazy, apartheid-supporting uh, lunatics, you know, uh, uh, that all these, that, that these bluff, uh, bow-tie-wearing, uh, seemingly good-humored people uh, were just, uh, just politically completely wicked in the one great cause that cricket has had, which is South Africa. They were all to a man on the wrong side. Except Arlott, of course, whose uh, whose role has been documented so well, and uh, his uh, involvement yeah, I mean, with uh, Basil, Basil with, Dolliver. With, yeah. with Dolliver. You know, I think one of uh, one of the things that's uh, uh, that's you know, it's got nothing to do with cricket per se, but one of the things that is just deeply disappointing about uh, about contemporary Indian cricket is is the sense of. Uh, there being absolutely no moral compass. Now, you know, the moment someone of a certain age begins talking about a moral compass and it's time to reach for your gun and probably shoot him. But, you know, it is true that uh, nobody expects cricketers to be heroes. Though, you know, uh, I don't know if it's urban legend, but the one story I insist on believing is that 
Gavaskar rescued a group of uh, of stranded Muslims during uh, the great Bombay killing pogrom of Muslims in the early 1990s. You don't expect everyone to do that. I mean, uh, nobody, you know, you, you don't know whether you do that yourself. You don't expect other people to be heroes. But what is really just profoundly disappointing about this generation of cricketers, and it's, you know, I speak specifically to uh, uh, the regimes that we've seen uh, under Dhoni and Kohli, is this sort of mindless uh, and and proactive uh, engagement with the worst of the nation state. I mean, uh, what kind of cricket? The time when I I found it really hard to believe. Uh, that people could be as mute and cowardly as this was when Jafar was accused of uh, of being uh, a communal by uh, the board that he was coaching for, and none of these people said a word. And what is you know what's really interesting is we all know this. Just before that, you had this uh, uh, this really embarrassing, uh, cringe-making, toe-curling moment when they all tweeted in a kind of mad unison uh, about the farmer's strike that was happening in my neighborhood in Delhi. I mean, uh, every one of them, the coach, I mean, Shastri, Kohli, Rohit Sharma, your hero, Mahesh, all of these wretches tweet out identical tweets. For what? Because, I mean, you can't find a way of saying no. You know, uh, uh, the argument that what can a cricketer do? After all, it's his livelihood. After a point, it's just purest nonsense. I mean, you have to say that uh, I won't do this. It's not as if you're being asked proactively to do something. You know, it's not as if you're saying, it's not as if you're critiquing the state. You're just saying that, look, I don't want to be... Uh, 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 be uh, issuing reposts to Rihanna. I mean, really, that's your business to actually take up cudgels on behalf of the uh, nation state against uh, uh, these sort of Barbadians at the gate. It's lunatic. And yet all of them did. They all stood in a row and tugged their forelocks and put out these tweets. And then when a comrade of theirs is, is vilely denounced in this way, not one of them. This, you know, Rahane is asked uh, about this. He says, uh, no, I'm not informed about this, so I cannot say anything. I mean, what, he's been your teammate. You've shared a dressing room with him. The, the sort of shamelessness and the timorousness of it, it just passes belief. You know, which is why when people tell me that, uh, that uh, the Indian cricketing establishment in its cricketing policies is rational, I want to believe them, but it's hard not to believe that there isn't a kind of compromise that takes place when you agree to shill for a state. When you agree to shill for a state, you're doing something which is a transaction, which is not a cricketing transaction. And you know, whenever you do that, you create the possibility of quid, quid pro quos. You create the possibility of non-cricketing reasons for cricketing decisions. So my position regarding contemporary Indian cricket is one of radical skepticism. You know, uh, uh, I don't think you have to be a troll to believe that, you know, whether it's Shastri or Kohli or Dhoni. You know, the other thing is the deranged militarism uh, of this team following Dhoni's example. What is this madness? What kind of team prances around in, you know, if you want to go play home guard, you should play, go, play, go play home guard, you know, become a boy scout or a scout master. You know, why impose this on the team? Which brings me to a larger point, actually. And I'm glad you brought this up because, uh, you know, the whole thing about this team representing India, you know, which has been historically the sort of falsehood that has been perpetrated when actually it is just representing a private body called the PCCI is number one. But of course, all sports are sort of now co-opted into this whole nationalistic, patriotic kind of uh, zone. But to be fair, all, all sports associations have always, A, been co-opted by the state and B, wanted to be co-opted by the state. I mean, you know, this just goes with the territory. You can't have a representative team without some informal claim of ownership. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
But the uniformity yeah. with which these guys have fallen in line, I mean, the point that you make, you don't have to be a hero, but don't be a villain at least, you know, like... No, no, that's exactly right. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, one, there's one cricketer who's a particularly uh, interesting case. So Kumble issues a completely craven tweet on this uh, uh, Delhi farmers thing. You know, unlike Kohli's, which is, uh, I think Kohli must have felt some residual sense of embarrassment. So his tweet is actually a short one with the more egregious bits left out. But <clears throat> Kumble tweets the whole template, you know, all of it. But what's interesting about Kumble is that when Jafar is in trouble, he gets up and in a non-committal way says, you know, with, you know, we are with you. He doesn't, he doesn't grandstand and he doesn't say, I don't think you're communal, which he could have and I think should have said. But he just gets up there and says, that, look, uh, you know, as a comrade, uh, you know, you have my support. It wasn't a political position. It was just an act of solidarity. Dada Ganesh did it for heaven's sake. You know, it was almost as if with the luminous exception of Kumble, that if you had achieved anything in Indian cricket past or present, you couldn't speak for Jaffa. I mean, Chandrakant, Pandit, Dada Ganesh, and then of course you have, you have, you know, this colossus Kumble. And I felt in a weird way, just deeply grateful to Kumble for having said this. And he didn't say much anyway, but even that we are grateful oh, for because that's the standard. Even that, because, you know, yeah. small mercies. When you look at the rest of them, I mean, nobody expects anything from Tendulkar. I mean, Tendulkar has, uh, you know, his post-cricketing career uh, is, you know, basically was like a continuous audition as a mascot for something or the other. So, you know, uh, so nobody really expects uh, Tendulkar to have a view uh, <clears throat> that infringes in any way out of, uh, you know, corporate wisdom. But what about all the others? I mean, of course, uh, uh, in another in another world, in another country, I'd have, I, I'd have hoped that Gavaskar would have said something uh, faintly redeeming, but he didn't. So, which brings me to the point, though. I mean, of course, uh, I am in complete agreement with you about uh, the far, both the farmers, the tweets about the farmers' protest, as well as the tweets about uh, uh, Rihanna uh, and her tweet. I mean, of all the people to go after, I mean, this is like it's taking such absurdity to the extreme. Uh, but but um, you know the bigger issue here is that probably for the first time in the history of the BCCI, and you have been following Indian cricket for far longer than I have, is that for a long time the even though the BCCI had many politicians uh, involved and many politicians running the game, there was a sense of bipartisanship in terms of the game itself, and sort of even though the politics was very much part of the game, it was not. Uh, you know, uh, propelling the game uh, in ways that we are seeing now. Now, pr probably for the first time, is that the party in power in the center and the BCCI are so uh, joined at the hip that uh, several of the decisions that are being taken are probably not only cricketing, but also political. As we see with the, uh, when the stadium in Ahmedabad gets, uh, uh, you know, inaugurated, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know, uh I think it's fair to say that uh, that businessmen and politicians have always had an interest in cricket. But it's also true to say that uh, the class of businessmen that associated itself with cricket up to, uh, say, even the turn of the century, they were essentially small and middling businessmen. You know, they weren't the really big behemoths. There was no, uh, you know, Ambani style or Tata or Bidla style. Uh, these were businessmen who actually leveraged uh, their position as cricket's patrons to, uh, you know, to build up a higher profile for themselves. This is especially... Like you're talking about the Vankades and the Chinnaswamis and... The Vankades yeah. and the Chinnaswamis and the Chidamra and so on. Um, uh, the Rungtas and, uh, you know, in Rajasthan and, uh, and Dalmia and, and all the rest. And, you know, of course, you know, Sharad Pawar was involved in the administration of cricket. There were congressmen. Who, but I think, like everything else, uh, the BJP has not only a complete understanding of, uh, of the economic heft of an institution, in this case, cricket. But also it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, cricket as a staging ground uh, for raising profile, for, uh, for, in a sense, claiming credit for something that is ubiquitously in the minds of Desis. Uh, 
And I think the most grotesque example of its politicization was uh, the IPL in Delhi during the second wave. There was absolutely no reason uh, for that phase of IPL's matches to be played. I mean, they were playing the IPL in Delhi at, at a time when literally thousands of people were dying. When, uh, you know, when, uh, when people were burning their dead uh, on, uh, on ad hoc plots outside of cemeteries. You know, you have to be brain dead not to see that this is, that this is grotesque. But I think what happens is that uh, because the government and the BJP state bulk so large over the BCCI, I think the normal self-preservation, the normal common sense that would go back on a feedback loop to the state saying that, look, this is not a good idea, that this might, instead of redounding to your credit, this might actually make you badnam. You know, it's like, it's like the Chinese famine and nobody dared to tell the party bosses that people were dying. So I don't think, you know, I don't even think that it's, uh, I don't think it's, uh, you know, uh, Jay Shah saying, uh, we will hold the match in Delhi regardless of whether people die. I don't think that's what's happening. I think there's some sense in which people think that this is what the state wants. We want to project normalcy. So we will do this. And you know, the time it takes for this behemoth to reverse, to reverse gear and to stop this. I mean, I think that's the difficulty with this kind of top-down politicization. Apart from, of course, the aesthetic horror of watching, you know, great cricketers like, uh, 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 like, uh, uh, you know, like Kohli uh, and Dhoni genuflect to these pygmies. Yeah, and also, I mean, it's it's not just holding the matches, right? It's also like completely disregarding what is happening, like a, a like a, things like black armbands or things like just a message at the toss. Everything was just uh, just done away with. It was like. This is an alternate reality. This is happening here. Whatever is happening outside is doesn't concern us. Yeah, I think um, I think it's certainly true that uh, that while cricket uh, has always been irradiated with conflicts of interest, I mean, we saw this with Srinivasan uh, at a time when the BJP was uh, nowhere on the horizon. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, conflicts of interest. We've seen corruption. We've seen patronage. Uh, we've seen all of this before, but. I think it now happens uh, on, a, on a kind of undreamt of scale. I effectively, the BCCI is an arm of the state. You remember there was a time you were making the point that the BCCI is actually a private organization, not actually a national team. You know, there was a time when someone wanted the RTI Act to apply to the BCCI. So that's when the BCCI actually made a legal argument in front of the court saying, we are not a government institution. We are a privately run trust, and therefore we are not subject to the RTI. And I think if I remember right, the court judgment was said something to the effect that uh, literally that, you know, since the nation has a proprietary interest in you, uh, you can't make this argument. Is it, is it fair to say that it's, it's probably the first regime in BCCI where, where there's a very direct consequence of you not being seen as pro a certain party and which is a party in power. Like, I would like to believe it has never been the case where it is so explicit. I don't think it, I don't think it, uh, you know, uh, I don't think it ever was the case. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that no Indian cricketer looked over his shoulder and thought, uh, you know, I need to keep my political affiliations quiet because something might happen or I need to speak up on behalf of X or Y. You know, people join political parties, people join the Congress. Uh, you know, Rajiv Shukla seems to have serially joined uh, many political organizations. Uh, Gautam Gambhi joined the BJP. So people had political preferences. They made them immediately after they left cricket. Chetan Chauhan was associated with the BJP. But there was never the sense that there were consequences for this. Or there was never the sense that you had to bat on the front foot for the ruling dispensation. I mean, that is unprecedented. And that, you know, on the one hand, we talk about uh, how uh, the BCCI is one of the strongest, most resilient, one of the most efficient and best organized cricketing organizations in the world. And I don't know enough about administration, but I'm happy and I hope to believe that. On the other hand, you have this behemoth, which is the 800 pound gorilla in any ICC meeting. And yet, 
it is so spavined and spineless that is incapable of advising its political masters that it's not a good idea to make the entire cricket team tweet stuff out in chorus but what is genuinely dismaying what is genuinely dismaying is that sometimes the initiative seems to come from the players i mean you know i remember the uh, uh the thing where they decided to wear fatigue caps i think the initiative for this came from dhoni now it's completely reasonable uh for for the cricket team to decide that it wants to dedicate a match to raise money uh for indian soldiers you know this is the kind of patriotic thing that is routinely done in sport all over the world i mean it's done in american football more than more than any other but this idea that we are going to proactively step forward and demonstrate you know our abiding commitment uh, to the military by wearing fatigue caps in a cricket match i mean this too is unprecedented so how do you, as a, as a historian and as a, as well as as a cricket fan and and as a political commentator how do you see this sort of uh, proactive sort of alignment to the to the to the big bosses uh, is is it just a case of the cricketers going down to power and knowing which way the the wind is uh, blowing or is it also a question of just like the broader society about how a lot of the the in the, the suppressed bigotry so to say is coming out to the surface now because of the people in power is it also a question of players finding a voice that they didn't find earlier now like why i'm asking that is if i am a mohammed siraj or a mohammed shami for instance how would i find the dressing room when people around me are tweeting you know stuff like this is it just a question of them being vulnerable sportsmen who have their livelihood at stake and they got to kind of go ahead, go with, go with the sort of powers that we are or do you see it as something else you know uh, first let me say that uh, the fact that they all lined up and tweeted uh, on behalf effectively of the state uh, as far as the farmers agitation was concerned you know i don't think that speaks directly to how things would be in the dressing room because fortunately that doesn't touch upon the kinds of communal divisions that uh, you know that have opened up in uh, in politics and society over several years but i think what does speak to it is uh, for example their silence you know you wouldn't be human if you were uh, you know uh, a muslim player in the indian team and you uh, you know you obviously know who jaf who jafar is and you know what he's done and you know that he's a kind of pillar of both the test and the and the first class uh, establishment and to find this kind of calumny and slander go unaddressed by your peers people you look up to you know implicitly must teach you some kind of lesson you know, i still want to believe and i do believe that i don't think uh, you know selection in indian cricket has been communalized uh, we can talk academically over the long span about whether uh, you know uh, whether being subaltern or whether uh, belonging to certain kinds of forward castes has given you on train to cricket and whether people who belong to uh, you know more subaltern sections in society have have or ha- haven't had access that's a good argument and then, you know that's that's a good area to talk about but i don't think uh i don't think indian cricket has ever been communalized you know i, I don't think that is something that that has ever entered into uh, to questions of selection and god willing it won't but i can't help thinking that uh you know with the best will in the world unless unless you keep some deep blue water between yourself and the state unless you take the trouble and unless you uh, you know take the courage into your hands to keep the state at arm's length to say no as say gil did uh, when they were encouraged to tweet uh, you know you effectively create a circumstance where something bad will happen you know yeah so i'll link um, a speech that uh, mukul had given about um, this whole nationalism and sport and in that he says that uh, you know the initial thought about the ipl was it would go the way of um, the english premier league and other european leagues but now it seems more likely that it could uh, follow the model of the national football league in the us uh, the american football where uh, you know the uh, which is so sort of uh, deeply uh, mixed with the patriotism and the army and uh, uh, the government and so on 
so that'll be a great primer for those of you who want to understand nationalism and uh, sport. Um, I also, what I also want to bring in is this fans' point of view because there comes a point of time in different teams for different reasons where you tend to fall out of love with your own team. I mean, it happened to me in the early 2000s when the whole match fixing uh, episode broke out and many people who I uh, deeply adored growing up were caught in the mix. And and for me, honestly, it felt like, what is the point of watching this match game anymore? Does it doesn't matter. And so for many months, I went without watching cricket until, of course, that famous series that we spoke about when um, Lakshman had and Dravid and all of them, Harbhajan Singh, they came and that that sort of brought me back to cricket in a way that, um, you know, I don't think um, many other things could have. I mean, cricket eventually came back. But these days I meet people and there are many people who are quite disillusioned with this team. Uh, they, of course, completely agree that they are very good cricketers and they're very skilled and they're perhaps one of the best team, best Indian teams ever. I mean, that that is no doubt. But they are also, you know, all these aspects of it, you know, tweeting in support of the establishment or not coming in support of a teammate who, you you know, who it's like basic courtesy to stand up for. Uh, these are things that are also making people, you know, sort of tune off at times. And they're like, yes, they are. I mean, of course, there are other minor, there are the smaller irritants, like uh, how Virat Kohli behaves uh, during a game many times or how the team May, uh, the team often gets this into this uber aggressive uh, mode. That, but that is, I think, more a minor irritant than the major irritant of being how uh, sort of uh, in line they seem to be with uh, whatever they're told, and and the cravenness, as you mentioned. So, uh, and of course, this is not new. I mean, this has happened to teams all over the world. I mean, I I have met South Africans who, uh, you know, uh, non-white South Africans who have uh, said that their parents could never get to support the South African team when they were playing, um, you know, whether it was the Rebel Tours or whether it was actual South African teams. Uh, of course, we know the history of uh, India playing a couple of games in Srinagar and being booed uh, in Kashmir in the 80s, etc., etc. But as a fan, how do, you, how do you reconcile with it? I mean, I don't think, for me personally, I don't think the option is to tune out. But I also struggle sometimes to... Uh, separate the the politics from the cricket, and I wonder often: should we even separate it, or should we try and find a way to reconcile with everything while watching? You know, I think it's uh, it's uh, not just a very good question. It's central to it's sort of existentially central to being a cricket fan. And uh, speaking for myself, I've you know I've never been through a phase where I didn't turn on the cricket. I mean, I I'm just uh, I'm just addicted to uh, India playing test matches. I watch uh, all the days I can. Uh, but there have been times when I've uh, when I've watched despite myself, you know. So it's a given I will watch. Uh, but I can remember a time when I, when I uh, uh, when I really didn't want to watch them play. I did anyway, but. You remember the time when uh, uh, you remember the sort of Andrew Simons went, went uh, yeah. through that uh, through monkey chance in India and and the following series was a very mixed affair for me. You know, when we toured Australia, I was on the one hand just madly fired up by that uh, you know by that series because it was such a dramatic series and uh, uh, it it was so epic in the cricket. But there was that horrible passage in it when you know. Uh, the whole Simmons affair where um, where there was a kind of uh, quasi-judicial process uh, where Tendulkar testifies on behalf of Harbhajan Singh. I think the moment when Harbhajan made what has to be the most magnificently disingenuous argument ever made in a courtroom, where basically Harbhajan's arguing that I didn't say monkey, I said maki. You know, you think this must be the only time in the history of law that someone actually formally pleaded guilty to, uh, I mean, to that word. You know, and I can understand why there was, uh, you know, the team was all fired up. There was a great deal at stake. But this wasn't a position that any follower of Indian cricket wants to be. When you have to choose between, uh, between your cricketing heroes and uh, and racism, you know. And I heard 
the number of disingenuous arguments I heard from friends of mine saying that, no, no, I mean, uh, those uh, pant shirt men in Indian stadiums who were making sort of monkey positions, you know, going like this when Simmons was on the boundary line, that, you know, this wasn't racism. It was just a really bad time to be a fan, you know, because there was something, I think there was some sense in which in a passive aggressive way, Indian cricket, its fans included, were sort of flexing their muscles, were pushing back against a dominant cricket side, but were also increasingly aware of the economic clout that they had in the big game. And it altogether created a very toxic set of attitudes uh, as far as the Simmons business was concerned. I mean, uh, the question also props up because you wrote this lovely piece on um, Mohammad Siraj uh, during the uh, India tour to Australia when Siraj basically made his debut. And you took on, I mean, you took off from the movie Iqbal, the famous uh, Hindi movie Iqbal that came out in 2005. And you spoke about how, you know, the, in 2005, the fact that the protagonist was a, a Muslim uh, was just part of the story. But were that movie to be made today, if at all it is even, if someone even dares to make a movie like that with a Muslim prota protagonist, uh, his identity as a Muslim will be, will be in the fore. What I want to understand is that, you know, as a viewer, when you're watching like a Siraj Bol or a Shami Ranin, irrespective of what they are thinking or what their background is, there is also a layer in your head that is saying they are a Muslim. Uh, you know, perhaps there is a layer in your head. And if that is, is that a tragedy? That we have begun to look at people not just as cricketers, but as uh, Muslims. And, uh, or is that a sign of, uh, you know, being more informed adults while watching the game? No, you know, first of all, I think it's important to say that uh, even when Iqbal was made, it was very unusual to have a Muslim protagonist in a film where his Muslimness didn't matter. You know, uh, so it, what I mean is that when Shah Rukh Khan makes uh, acts in My Name is Khan, uh, the Muslim character has something to do with the way in which Muslims are seen. So it's sort of charged with, uh, you, you know, the idea of this, this religious identity. The lovely thing about Iqbal was he just happened to be Muslim in the way that he happened to be deaf, you know. It was just a given. And that was unusual. And it was just very, you know, sort of carried off very lightly. And it was, uh, it was, it was just this very nice, uh, uh, this very nice feel good film, which managed to carry off this interesting twist. About the second question about as a fan, when you watch the cricket being played, are you aware of people's religious identity? In a country like India, it would be disingenuous to say that there's some perfect state of innocence in which you watch uh, stuff unaware of a person's identity. You know, was I aware that Bishan Singh Bedi was a Sikh? Yes, of course I was. Or was I aware that uh, the Nawab of Patodi was a Muslim? Yes, I was, except that his being Muslim seemed sort of less important than his being posh and being a kind of Nawab. I mean, you know, that was what struck you about the Nawab, not that he was uh, uh, he was Muslim. So you didn't really think that the Nawab of Patadi and Abid Ali had anything in common. They were both Muslims, but you know, Abid Ali was Abid Ali, the Nawab of Patadi was, you know, you know, the guy went to Winchester and he played for Sussex and, you know, his dad captained India. And I mean, we didn't even know that Patadi was a relatively small principality on the edges of Delhi and Haryana, but it just seemed very grand. So yes, we were aware of it, but, uh, and, you know, in our more self-aware moments, we were also vaguely self-congratulatory in the same way as Indians tend in a sort of tiresome way to be self-congratulatory about the fact that, you know, we had a Muslim president or we had a Muslim chief justice, because really speaking, uh, it's your way of telling yourself that you're a good guy rather than uh, making an important statement. But it's, you know, it's worth saying, so you say it. So I think, yes, I think the answer to that question is yes, we were, but I mean, for example, for the longest time as a child, I didn't know that Farooq engineer was a Parsi. I knew that he had a weird name, but uh, I wasn't certain whether he was Parsi or Farooq, you know, could be Muslim, who knows. I didn't know that Rusi Surti was, uh, was a Parsi either. It was just, you know, how you are as a child. You, don't, you really don't know that much. As an adult, I suppose you... Uh, 
you know, when you begin to argue about your game, when you begin to juxtapose your game against the games in other countries, uh, maybe you look at your team and you uh, swank about the, uh, you know, the multiculturalism of it, but you don't do that much of it. Basically, you just, you know, you follow the game and you, and you revel in your heroes. Did I feel in some, uh, you know, in some visceral way that Azhar was a Muslim? Frankly, no. I mean, uh, when I first saw him in his three, first three tests, I thought he's an incredibly boring batsman. You know, he, he scored three hundreds and he got them like a snail, and they were really flat tracks. And I said, and you know, Azhar had hadn't then achieved that tubular, sinewy avatar. He looked literally as if he was a stick figure, uh, you know, playing cricket. And he seemed uh, he seemed interesting but unprepossessing. And then, of course, my son and I, my son was very little through the 90s, but we became just these uh, fanatical bhakts. You know, we, uh, you, you know, when he, when, you know, he reinvents himself as a batsman. After being this uh, Pujara-esque figure uh, with a kind of wristy twirl, he suddenly becomes this deranged attacking batsman who scorns defense. You know, that famous hundred he made in response to Gucci's treble hundred in vain, of course, but most great Indian hundreds in those days were made in vain. But, you know, we loved it. It was like, uh, you know, it was heaven come early. So I don't think, I don't think there was a, I don't think there was a kind of day-to-day -day or moment-to-moment -moment awareness. Uh, maybe, you know, in retrospect or uh, in the course of an argument, you might, you know, you might talk about their identities, but uh, it it generally wouldn't have to do that much about the cricket, you know. When I was writing that piece on, on Siraj, uh, I wrote a line which said, you know, there might come a time when, uh, you know, uh, two Muhammads might be bowling on either end for India. After it was published, I read it and I sort of winced. I thought that, you know, uh, that this seemed, uh, this seemed sort of unnecessary. Uh, but I also had some sense about why I had written it, simply because it's very difficult in a charged circumstance not to ventilate these things. And it's, it's not what you want to do, you know, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's too much to ask to be left alone in your, you know, in your cricketing womb, because there is a world outside. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, like one of the, you know, one of the sad tweets that I read among, of course, attend probably millions of sad tweets that I read every day. But something that really made me wince, as you use the word, was uh, when Siraj uh, was, uh, you know, uh, the team was lining up for the national anthem and Siraj happened to tear up. Uh, who knows why he teared up? It could have been his memory of his father. It could have been just the emotional effect of the national anthem. It could have been anything. And he teared up and the cameras then zoom in on him. And then that whole video, Mohamed Kaif tweets out that whole video and says that uh, I want to remind some of my countrymen. I mean, I, I don't remember the exact tweet, but he I know what you mean. I read, I, I read that tweet. And I exactly. Think, I, think, I think I'm glad you raised this because, you know, my memory of Mohamed Kaif is, uh, you know, magically uh, the editor of Crick Info uh, got me uh, entree into the press box at Lord's. I happened to be in England with my family and uh, I talked somebody into getting me on train to the press box. So I remember taking a bus uh, down to, I think it was what, Swiss Cottage or some such place. And I walked to, I walked to Lord's, I was a bit late. And, and then I go up this stalk into this giant eye and I'm watching this match and we're doing really, really badly because the English seem to be uh, sort of possibly about to overhaul us. But I remember Kev, and uh, my memories of Kev and Yuvraj are the heroes of that match and in the immediate aftermath of the match as the future of Indian cricket. That, you know, Yuvraj and Kev are these two young men who will carry us forward. And the way it happens in cricket is that, you know, you have a sort of Lakshman Dravid partnership, you have a Yuvraj Kev partnership, and they sort of twinned in your mind because of their cricketing exploits, you know? It didn't, uh, uh, and I'm not being disingenuous, and I'm sure you, the two of you, have, it's, it didn't occur to anyone to think that, you know, uh, Kaif, you know, that Kaif was a Muslim. You knew that he was a Muslim. Of course you did. 
but it wasn't important. You know, in the same way as, you know, one of my heroes at the turn of the century was, uh, was Irfan Pathan. Uh, and I will go to my grave blaming Greg Chappell for messing his mind up. Uh, but, but that's just because I detest Greg Chappell. It's got nothing to do with what he might or mightn't have done. But, uh, but you know, uh, Irfan Pathan was, um, was just this, this great, uh, you know, this, this potentially great all-rounder. This, it helped that he was this wonderful looking man. And, but Muslim really, you know, uh, nobody spent any time on this. You were aware of it in the way that you are, you know, aware that the sky is blue, but it wasn't salient. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as fans, you know, going forward, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, there will be a number of such instances where we will have to uh, grapple with both the what we are watching uh, on the field of play, as well as our sort of uh, the larger issues of politics and society that comes into our heads. And I think that is a serious challenge for fans going forward. It's not just, and, and that is also a challenge of being a fan as an adult, because as a child, it's, uh, you know, completely, uh, you're watching the sport and you're in a cocoon and that is pretty much it. But as an adult, I think one of the challenges of following a sport as an adult is to grapple with these various contradictions that come in and yet to be able to find a way to enjoy what you're watching because after all, that is the point. <laughs> you know, truth be told, there's nothing that I want to do more than retreat into that cocoon because I can't imagine a better time than this to be an Indian Test cricket fan. I mean, after decades of not knowing where your next meal or metaphorically uh, your next meal is going to come from. You know, to be in the midst of this abundance and plenty to, you know, to look, on, look upon talents like, like Bumra and Gil and Kohli and Rohit Sharma and, uh, and, you know, just so many others, all in one team at the same time, uh, you know, the likes of Shami and Siraj and Yadav, you know, uh, someone should put out, uh, he should, you know, put out a, a, a cheer for Yadav because there's some sense in which I think he's always turned up. I think he's, I think he's, he's a first rate uh, fast bowler and it must have been incredibly frustrating for him after, you know, that series of injuries in Australia to find himself on the margins of a team where he had a reasonable claim to being, you know, the first substitute, so to speak. But, you know, to be in the middle of such plenty, all you want to do is to be left alone to watch the cricket. And the trouble is, this actually involves some degree of, of fortitude and dignity and integrity on the part of the people who represent us, not in their game. And, you know, I think as far as the game is concerned, they have all of that. But just in terms of, you know, their public room, or at least... Uh, if not, uh, you know, uh, God forbid, you know, we don't want, uh, you know, 11 people uh, uh, being proactively activist. But, you know, just so that you can allow us to pretend uh, that uh, test cricket is, uh, is bracketed off, if only temporarily, from the rest of the world. Amen. Which, which uh, brings me to actually to a point where uh, we can probably, um, you know, wrap up. Uh, we've been going on for a long time. But the one point that I definitely want to ask you about now that you've brought up the Indian fast bowling and Bumrah and things like that. I mean, for us watching, I mean, I began watching cricket in the late 80s. And so for me, the current Indian bowling lineup is like, uh, you know, something that is un untested, uncharted territory for me. I mean, I've never seen an Indian team uh, with such good bowling depth and such good bowling attack. And Bumrah, I mean, as uh, we have discussed on our podcast, I mean, the um, Shami, Ishan, Tumesh, everyone else is obviously like a, a fantastic in themselves. But Bumrah is almost becoming into like a, like a higher order of uh, fast bowling. I mean, we have gone from uh, Ishan to Bumrah in like, which was almost like a gap of 25, 30 years normally, but we have just gone in three years there. Um, but as somebody who, you know, was around at that time, please tell us about how it was in the late 70s and early 80s when Kapil Dev emerged. Because uh, Mahesh believes, and I agree, that, uh, you know, if Bumrah seems like something that's just arrived from nowhere, Kapil must have just been 
some i mean i don't know what i can't even use any words it's in, it's incalculable i mean i was i was a student in england when the indian team toured and it was a great series for both of them you know he hit a colossal double century if memory serves me right took lots of wickets but there was this magnificent innings by kapil i think it was in 80 which was so violent which was so exhilaratingly violent that you watched this man and you thought you know all i want to do is watch this man i have no way you know i don't i'm not even invested in the fortunes of the indian cricket team to watch someone you know bowl fast medium and bat the way he did and field with his lightness his first tour was that tour of uh, of pakistan where we couldn't believe our eyes you know on those flat pitches against that great attack you know it was uh, imran and uh, sarfraz nawaz and i think sikandar bakht if memory serves me right not as great as the attacks that followed but you know certainly a fine attack and you know uh, before you know it's important to understand what we had before kapil before kapil our main claim to uh, to sort of med- medium pace verging on fast medium was karsan gavri who took a large quantity of his wickets as a left arm spinner who i'm convinced chucked his fast ball you know uh, he had this sort of jerky left so he Uh, he switched from bowling uh, you know medium to i mean and then there was madanlal i mean madanlal was a really game guy and i'll forever forever admire him uh, for those three fours he hit off thompson backing away from the stumps till thompson figured that you know uh, instead of trying to maim him he should just try and bowl him i was listening to i think alan mcgillray uh, uh, commentating on uh, on uh, on abc on this but you know madanlal with respect ran up to the stumps faster than the ball traveled once he gotten there you know uh, i followed teams where kundaran opened the bowling kundaran budhi kundaran on tour in england opened the bowling and uh, urban legend has it that uh, he was asked and what do you bowl he said i'll have to bowl to find out <laughs> i mean uh gavaskar opened uh, the bowling uh we've played four spinners uh bedi used to routinely take the ball on the third the fifth over even when we had abid ali and solkar i mean i think chandrashekhar was faster than solkar <laughs> you know <laughs> i mean it's it's in uh, kapil dev's arrival is incomprehensible because you know apart from anything else he's the spectacular all round talent he doesn't do justice to his batting but I mean, uh, that great cricketing cliche: how cleanly he hit the ball. But it wasn't just how cleanly he hit the ball; it was the it was the uh, slightly, you know, mad grace with which he hit it. You know that famous Natraj shot, that extravagant pick-up shot that he played. I mean, you just looked at him, and uh, he seemed like someone. something that had grown directly out of zeus's forehead and been deposited on a cricket field it was just uh, you, look uh, uh, bumrah is, is a great great bowler but uh, in terms of uh, a historical landmark in indian cricket he's a candle to kapil dev sun you know he's uh, uh, kapil dev was transformative just the and you know in, in the end uh, unfair though it is uh um, your uh, your iconic status or lack thereof is based upon those hinge moments where you triumph and he won the 83 world cup you know uh it's uh, everybody who talks about 83 even people who were completely committed to, to test cricket like gavaskar will frankly acknowledge that this is this was the summit of uh our national achievement as a cricketing nation i mean the fact that it seemed like a series of spectacular flukes uh, you know there was that moment when 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 the telecast goes off for about 40 minutes during the west indies innings wasn't the time when viv richards uh, was batting now i can't remember whether the telecast came on again and we okay. saw a uh, kapil catch richards or whether we saw that on playback because i know that i watched live gordon greenidge uh shoulder arms to to balvinder sandhu and have his uh his bails disturbed you know it was um 
but it was, what were the odds? There was, you know, I had uh, a friend of mine, uh, Geeti Hassan, who was a, she was a PhD student in microbiology at Cambridge who had no interest in cricket. So one of her lab uh, colleagues uh, had two tickets and because the English got knocked out in the semifinals, he decided he didn't want to go. Huh. So Geeti, who had absolutely no interest in cricket, wandered off to watch this match. And I've never forgiven her for doing this because I should have been there, you know? And I had returned from England just, you know, just, just a year before that. And this undeserving person actually gets to watch the match. It was like, a, like some cosmic injustice. I mean, uh, you know, sh she didn't know Kirti Azad from Maulana Azad, you know? <laughs> By the way, Kirti Azad used to play cricket for my college. Uh, you know, he, he, I was two, three years ahead of me. And I think at the time he was a fast bowler. He used to bowl, you know, he used to continuously pitch short at, uh, at opposing batsmen. Um, yeah, I was, you know, it was quite interesting to see him in his, uh, in his sort of international avatar as a kind of rubbish off spin bowler. Off spinning all rounder, <laughs> or rather, a batsman who could also bowl off spin. <laughs> but I mean, you know, uh, like it or not, uh, for the till the end of his days, he tell you that he won the World Cup, and he did. Of course, yeah. But but the, uh, the, uh, the thing about that World Cup, coming to that uh, uh, World Cup final, um, um, Mukul has written a lovely piece on that, and where he picks out this moment, you know, the perhaps the most important moment in that final, and no doubt, I mean, anybody who has seen Viv Richards bat knows what a absolutely ferocious, terrorizing batsman that he could be. And then he hits this ball in the air off Madan Lal, uh, the great Madan Lal that you have referenced before. And Mukul writes about how Kapil is not only running, you know, to catch the ball, he's running back to catch the ball, which anyone who has played cricket knows is one of the toughest catches to take. But he also seems to be smiling. And that is like such a phenomenal you observation. You should actually go back and watch that. You should... You know, I kept watching replays of this because I wrote this well afterwards. And I thought, he seems to actually be enjoying this. <laughs> and this is what we, you know, even with Gavaskar, till Kapil, uh, Kapil was like a giant exhalation. You know, till Gavaskar, watching Indian cricket was just a continuously tense business. You know, even, I mean, Gavaskar is a great, great man, but... There's a kind of attritional quality to what he, what he had to do necessarily, even though he had this great range of shots. He's a great, you know, there was a kind of, uh, uh, there was a liquid, again, all the cliches are true, this liquid loose limbed uh, ease to Kapil's play, which we had never seen before. Who played like this? I mean, who played in this extravagant, born to be a millionaire way, you know, he did. And we didn't even know where he had come from. Haryana? Who played cricket in Haryana? <laughs> you know, it was extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, but, you know, that, that, is, that, that, that isn't Bumrah's fault. It's like, um, I was reading uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould again, and he, I remember him saying that, you know, it's, it's no commentary on any great evolutionary theorist today that nothing he does will change the world like Darwin did. It, you know, it just can't happen anymore because, you know, he uses, as numerate people always do, you know, he says that Darwin pushes it so close to the right wall that there's, there's nowhere to go after a while, you know. And the context is given by what came before, right? I mean, it's one thing, I mean, Kapil as a batsman was unique, of course, but Kapil as a bowler was, was something India could not have imagined. Like even the dream of dreams of an Indian cricket fan wouldn't have imagined a bowler like Kapil there because there was no, nothing like that before in Indian cricket. And, and yeah. especially the couple of the early years where he was bowling quite fast. In fact, if he, even his action, if you look at the early years, uh, was, was nowhere like the couple of later years, which was a, a lot more controlled. But the early couple was just going full throttle all the time. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think there's this ball. I think there's this ball he bowls to Sadiq Muhammad, which hits him on the head. And I think that, that anybody who saw that moment, is, it's almost like it's frozen in time for them. It's like an Indian fast bowler hitting an opposition batsman on the head. <laughs> and you remember that wonderful photograph? I don't know if it, if it was Patrick Eager. Nearly all the great pictures of that time were Patrick Eager. It's, you know, uh, it's him and his delivery strike. And there's this curiously 
abandoned look to Kapil. You know, his head is thrown back in a way that's almost slightly unbalanced. His eyes are gleaming. Uh, you know, he suddenly looks like, uh, you know, he he suddenly looks like the vanguard we never had. You know, uh, this, this, the, it's the athleticism which is dazzling, you know. Because uh, Indian teams of the 60s and 70s were many things. But with the odd exception, like Solkar as a closing fielder, athletic, they were not. I mean, uh, you know, uh, at least two of our greatest spinners rapidly became sort of pear-shaped. And uh, Indian cricket actually uh, was the proof of the rule that international cricket is the one game you can play without actually being limber. No, Kapil was, uh, was just completely dazzling. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, we have taken up a lot of your time, Mukul, but let me take up a couple of more minutes of your time. Let me just take up, because we do this section where we ask uh, writers and journalists to pick out their favorite cricket book. You have, of course, spoken about a number of cricket books, but if you could just talk about one recommendation for a book that you would give people and why, just a brief uh, summary, that'll be great. Any one of three, uh, you know, the... The great three are uh, Marcus Sears, Anyone But England, Ram Guha's uh, Corner of a Foreign Field, and of course, C.L.R. James' Beyond the Boundary. And uh, anyone, you know, reading, the extraordinary thing about all three books is that because they're great works of history, and because they tell you about the social and political and material organization of the game in these specific countries or regions, whether it's the Caribbean or India or, or England, they actually give you what in the context of, of cricket is sort of universal insight. You know, you, you understand something about the game in general and those places in particular. So the epiphanies you have are simultaneously sort of game-wide as well as sharply focused in the context of those politics. And I'd say that if you, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you want to understand uh, cricket in what was its, I think its uniquest avatar, which is in the Caribbean, where essentially a group of uh, colonized islands were brought together by a game, uh, islands that fielded a team that was made up of several nations, a completely improbable team. I mean, there are only two West Indian institutions. One, was, one, is, the, one is the international team, the other is the University of the West Indies. Otherwise, they exist as separate nations. You know, just the idea that this team brought a sort of nation into existence every time you've walked into a pitch, you know, uh, gives me goose flesh. So uh, to read what this meant to the people who played this game through a period of radical racial discrimination and, you know, it, on its cover, if I remember right, the cover I, of the book I used to have, I've lost this now, has Sir Frank Worrell and is it Basil Butcher? I forget, uh, you know, on the cover. And and Frank Worrell came to my school uh, when, uh, when, when I was a boy and I couldn't meet him. And a year later, I think he died prematurely of leukemia. But I think the importance of, uh, the reason why I'd single out James above the others is because it, it tells you how this extraordinary game helped, uh, helped these islands imagine a community, you know? And imagine a community that was like a nation, but actually trans transcended the nation, that uh, that represented uh, emancipation, that actually represented transcendence. And it's the most moving story you'll ever hear told. Uh, so if I had to pick one, I'd pick that one. Otherwise, I just say, read all three. They're just, uh, they're without any question, the three greatest books written about cricket. So we, we are, uh, yes, books is something that's very close to us and cricket books. Uh, so we are hoping to do more podcasts on book specific things and for which I will probably invite you again at some point to talk about some book. I'd be delighted. Perfect. So uh, have a good evening, Mukul. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, guys. I'll let you know when this comes out. Okay. Thanks very much, guys. It's been, uh, it's been a real pleasure. Bye, Siddhartha. Bye, Mahesh. I'm, bye, I'm bye, glad bye. we waited till Rohit's stress career redeemed so that we could have this. You know, I, I flat out refused, Sidvi, that we're not going to host Mukul till Rohit's career is revived. So I'm glad we are meeting at this point. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent.
He'll come back for the second. India have won the test match. India have won the series. They're going to get back for two. India at home. Lords goes wild.